Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that I'm actually very surprised hasn't been covered more. I found out about this case while researching for another case and you might figure out which one it is several minutes into the video. If you figure out which case, let me know down below. But this is definitely an interesting case where I got to see how this case was solved from start to finish and those kinds of cases are always very interesting to read, especially ones that happened quite a few years ago. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Audible for partnering with me on today's video. I love Audible for so many different reasons. They offer a massive selection of audiobooks, podcasts, and originals across every and all genres. They have audiobooks about cooking, parenting, music, fantasy, and of course, true crime. I love listening to audiobooks while I'm doing tours around the house, taking my dog for a long walk, or especially on long drives or flights. This has been the summer of traveling for me. I've been traveling quite a bit recently and sitting back with an audiobook is the perfect way to spend those long hours driving or on a flight. One that I've been listening to is actually how I got a lot of information for this case. It's called Deadly American Beauty by John Glatt and it discusses the case of Kristen Rosam and her husband in great detail about her secret life that she was living until she found her husband dead from an apparent suicide. But if true crime audiobooks aren't your thing, Audible has literally everything that you can imagine in their massive library of titles. I also love learning new things whenever I can, so anytime I can get my hands on a new audiobook on money management or personal growth, I am all about it. New members can try Audible for free for 30 days, and as an Audible member, you get to choose one title per month to keep for yourself from the entire catalog, including bestsellers and new releases. Audible members also get full access to a growing selection of audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. You can download or listen to their included titles all you want, all the time. You can always find the best of what you love or try something new to discover with Audible. So if you want to try Audible for free for 30 days, make sure you click on the link down below and head to audible.com slash Rachel Shannon or text Rachel Shannon to 500 500 and note that both are case sensitive. Again, that's audible.com slash Rachel Shannon or text Rachel Shannon one word to 500 500. Both again are case sensitive. Thank you again so much to Audible for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Greg DeVillis and Kristen Rosam. Kristen Rosam was born to a well-off family with successful parents named Constance and Ralph, and she had two younger brothers, Brent and Pierce. Ralph Rosam worked as a professor of political philosophy and American constitutionalism. He also worked as a director of the Rose Institute for State and Local Government at Claremont McKenna College. Constance was a marketing and management professor and a director of a nonprofit graduate program at Azusa Pacific University. She also had her own consulting business. In addition to that, Constance was a senior research associate of the Rose Institute and she co-hosted a weekly TV show about business and public affairs in San Bernardino, California. Kristen grew up with her two siblings in Claremont, California, in their $700,000 home with a silver Mercedes parked in the front. Being from a family with such successful parents, Kristen and her siblings, of course, had high expectations placed on them, with Kristen having the highest expectations on her because she was the oldest. Kristen grew up wanting to prove herself to her parents, and she wanted to excel in everything that she did. Kristen was a beautiful little girl, with Kristen's mother actually starting her in modeling and ballet. But unfortunately, she ended up suffering stress fractures in both legs, which caused her to have to quit dancing. This caused some pretty significant mental issues in Kristen, having to give up something that she loved so much. She also had a lot more free time than she was used to after stopping ballet. So, while in high school, Kristen started experimenting with drugs, specifically methamphetamine. During her time in high school, she was actually caught a few times by her parents. She had stolen checks and credit cards to fund her habit, and her parents started to get suspicious. So, there was one time where Ralph accused 17-year-old Kristen of using drugs and hiding them in her backpack. So, he tried grabbing the backpack from her to check inside, and there was a bit of a physical altercation that happened as a result. 
During the altercation, Ralph hit his daughter in the arms several times in order to gain control of the backpack. Because of the incident, police were called, and at that time, they did catch her with the drugs, so they put her in handcuffs and took her away. Of course, she only spent a few hours in jail before her parents took her back home. Then there was another time that Kristen was caught with drugs again and she was arrested. During that incident, all that happened was that again, she just spent a few hours in jail and she was quickly released without charges. Those incidents seemed to cause Kristen to want to better herself. So, she quit using before going to college. Kristen went on to be accepted into the University of Redlands in Southern California, hoping to start new and go on with her life. However, after starting college, her addiction snuck back into her life and she started using again. She would travel back and forth between Tijuana and Redlands, California to buy the drugs. By the year 1994, Kristen left school without telling her parents and ran off to San Diego to continue using drugs in secret. It was actually that winter when her father, Ralph, went to pick her up from college that he realized that she was missing. It wasn't until a few months later that she resurfaced and they found out that she had been in San Diego the whole time. But while in San Diego, she met a man named Greg DeVillis. Greg DeVillis was born in Illinois to French-born parents Marie and Yives, and he had two younger brothers as well, Jerome and Bertrand. Greg's father, Yives, worked as a plastic surgeon, but he was estranged from his father and his parents were divorced. After meeting Greg, him and Kristen basically became inseparable. She spent her days at his apartment, and they quickly fell in love. Within just weeks, they were saying their I love yous to one another. During that same time, Greg found out about Kristen's drug problem, and by all accounts, he supported her and helped her get past it. He helped her stop using meth, and by the fall of 1995, Kristen re-enrolled in college. This time, she enrolled in San Diego State University, where she majored in biochemistry. Meanwhile, Greg was attending the University of California, San Diego, graduating with a degree in biology. From there, he started working as a business development manager at Orbigen Incorporated, a biotech company. While still in college, by the year of 1997, Kristen started work as an intern at the county's office of the medical examiner, or OME for short. At the time, she hadn't used drugs in two years, and there was nothing on the application that inquired about previous history of drug or alcohol alcohol use, so she was hired as an intern, no problem. By May of 2000, Kristen graduated from college with honors with her degree in biochemistry. Then, going back just a bit, by June of 1999, after dating for five years, her and Greg had gotten married. Immediately upon graduating, Kristen was then promoted to toxicologist at OME. So things were going really well for Kristen. She graduated from college, she was married to a husband who loved her, and she had a very steady job. Now, by some accounts from Kristen's family and friends, shortly after getting married to Greg, Kristen started to express concerns about her marriage. Even before the wedding, she told her mother that she wasn't sure if she wanted to go through with it, but her mom shook it off as normal pre-wedding jitters. Either way, after their marriage, Kristen started telling people that Greg was a bit suffocating, that he was too clingy, and things weren't going well. But to Greg, he thought his relationship was going great. He loved his wife, and he was excited about how much progress she had made in her life. He was excited to have kids with her one day, and things were really looking up for them in his mind. While working at OME as a toxicologist, a then 32-year-old man named Michael Robertson, who, like Kristen, was married, was hired to the position of a forensic laboratory manager at OME. This meant that he would be Kristen's manager. Michael was born in Australia, moving to the U.S. in 1996 to train as a fellow in forensic toxicology at National Medical Services in Pennsylvania eventually earning his doctorate in forensic medicine and gained his expertise on date rape drugs. While in Pennsylvania, he worked his way up to becoming the department director before he moved to San Diego to work as the toxicology lab manager. Now, the man that Michael replaced was named Russ Lowe, who had been working at OME for a long time, and he was acting as lab manager at that time. The fact that OME hired someone from the outside to replace him, rather than letting Russ keep the position since he was a loyal OME employee, 
that caused a bit of tension in the lab. Then to add to the tension, shortly after Michael started working as the lab manager, him and Kristen started having a secret affair. This was something that escalated very quickly and pretty much everybody around the office knew about it. A lot of coworkers reportedly resented Kristen for it because they thought that them having this relationship would mean special treatment for Kristen since Michael was her supervisor. So some of the coworkers complained about it to the administrative services manager, a woman named Jeanette, who then brought the concerns to OME's operations manager. He asked the coworkers about the affair and they admitted that they never actually saw them showing PDA. He also asked Michael about the affair and he also denied it as well. But behind the scenes, things with the affair escalated very quickly. They wrote love letters to one another. They sent each other gifts. And of course, they engaged in sexual relations very frequently as well. Then sometime between September and October of 2000, Kristen fell back into drug use. Now, part of Kristen's duties at work was that anytime there was a drug-related death, she had to record and manage any drug that came into the office. So like if drugs were confiscated or found at a crime scene or something like that, she would file them into the office. As she was falling back into her meth use, drugs started to go missing from the office. Then there was one weekend in late October when Michael and Kristen attended a conference together over the weekend. At the conference, they were a lot more open about their relationship and everybody around them could tell that they were clearly together. The conference was actually about the dangers of fentanyl, which was a drug that we all know about now because of how often we're seeing people die from overdoses. But back then, many toxicologists didn't even test for it because it was so rare. Now, when they got back from the conference, Greg started to notice changes. I bet he had started noticing changes long before this, but his wife started discussing a separation and living separately while he was all in on the relationship and he wanted no part of that. He grew into a bit of a depression because of this and he just wasn't in a good place mentally by all accounts. By early November, Greg actually found out about the affair that Kristen was having with her boss. He found one of the love letters that he had written her so on November 2nd, 2000, Greg actually confronted Kristen about it. He told her that he believed that she was using drugs again and having this affair with Michael. He said that if she didn't quit her job and quit using drugs, that he was going to tell OME about the drug use and the affair. But it seemed that she either refused or told Greg that she would stop the affair and would quit, but just wasn't actually planning on doing so. The day after Greg confronted Kristen about the affair, Kristen's mother, Constance, visited the couple at their San Diego apartment. While there, Constance said that she noticed that Greg appeared emotionally unstable. He seemed easily agitated and she could tell that he wasn't doing well mentally. They started looking at photos from their wedding, which took place just a year and a half prior, but according to Constance, this just made Greg very agitated. There was also some tension surrounding a bouquet of roses that he had gotten Kristen a week prior to her mother's visit. Apparently, Constance commented on the roses and he responded very eerily. He apparently responded in a dramatic, quivering voice of all the roses that single rose survives. So, she noticed all of these strange things about Greg, but according to her, she didn't notice anything in Kristen's behavior that told her that she was back into using drugs. As a side note, it had also been noted that Michael knew about her drug use, and even though he was her supervisor and it was obviously against OME's policy for her to be using drugs, it seemed that he just ignored it and let her pass. This isn't for sure, but that is what is believed by many people who investigated this case. By the morning of November 6th, 2000, Kristen would go on to say that when they woke up, Greg seemed very out of it. He seemed really groggy, his speech was a bit slurred, and he just didn't look well. So, at 7.42 a.m., she called Greg's work for him and left them a voicemail telling them that he wasn't going to make it into work because he was sick. Then, by about 8 a.m., Kristen went to work herself. 
About an hour after arriving to work, coworkers reported seeing Kristen crying in Michael's office, but they didn't exactly know why. By 12.10 p.m., by lunchtime, Kristen said that she went back to the apartment to check in on Greg. One of the office managers at her apartment complex actually observed her running into the apartment at that time, so it looked like she was in a hurry. After a half hour, Kristen left and she went to the grocery store at 12.41 p.m. She picked up several items and returned back to the apartment saying that she was having lunch with Greg. During lunch, Kristen said that she asked Greg why he was so out of it that morning and Greg apparently told Kristen that he had taken some of her oxycodone and clonazepam. Those were medications that Kristen had from years prior when she was at the tail end of her addiction. After lunch, she said that Greg went back to bed because he was still really tired. For the rest of that afternoon, she was sort of going back and forth between work and other places. She returned back to work after lunch, but she was only there for about another hour and a half or so before she left work at 2.30 p.m. and returned back to her apartment for a short time. The same office manager saw her car parked at the complex at 2.45 p.m. Then she left her apartment again to spend some more time with Michael. She hung out with Michael until around 5 p.m. before leaving and returning back to her apartment. Then she left again at 6.30 to run out and get some more groceries. When she got back to her apartment from the store at around 8 p.m., Kristen said that Greg appeared to be sleeping in the bed in their bedroom. So she kissed him on the forehead, then went into the bathroom to take a shower. But after taking her shower, she checked in on Greg again and she noticed that he was cold to the touch and he was not breathing. So immediately by 9.22 p.m., she called 911 to report that her husband had been sleeping and had suddenly stopped breathing. The operator told her to move Greg's body to the floor and begin CPR on him, so that is what she did. She stayed on the phone with the emergency dispatcher until paramedics arrived shortly after. However, when paramedics arrived, they found a bit of a bizarre scene. They found that Greg's body was lying on the floor next to his bed, and he apparently had rose petals sprinkled all around his body. When speaking with paramedics, Kristen told first responders that she didn't think Greg had taken any drugs that day. Of course, after finding Greg's body, paramedics got him into an ambulance and transported him to the hospital. They attempted life-saving measures, but it was too late. By 10.19 p.m., they arrived to the hospital, and it was there that Greg was pronounced dead. At that time, when he was pronounced dead, Kristen sort of changed her story, and she said that maybe Greg actually did take drugs. She said that she actually remembered him mentioning something about that, so she told the nurses that it was possible that Greg overdosed on oxycodone. After Greg was pronounced dead, of course, his body was sent off to the San Diego Medical Examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner determined that Greg had been dead for at least an hour before paramedics arrived. He had signs of bronchopneumonia, which happens when secretions in the lungs aren't being removed properly, which occurs when someone is not breathing or has very shallow breathing or has been unconscious for an extended period of time. The ME also noticed that Greg had a large amount of urine still in his bladder, about 550 milliliters, which would be very uncomfortable for someone who is conscious. So he thinks that Greg was unconscious for quite some time. Most people feel the need to empty their bladders when they have about 150 milliliters of urine in their bladder. So if they have 400 or more, that is when you get that really urgent feeling like you gotta go now and you can't hold it any longer. Yeah, Greg had 550 milliliters of urine in his bladder that would be incredibly uncomfortable. So based on the bronchopneumonia and the absurd amount of urine still in his bladder, the ME determined that Greg was most likely unconscious for at least about 6 to 12 hours before his death. Then for the toxicology report, the OME opted to send Greg to a third party called Pacific Toxicology to avoid any potential conflict of interest. However, the outside party was not immediately available to take his body, 
So Greg's body was stored at the OME's office and placed into one of their refrigerators for about 36 hours before it was transported. According to court documents, those bodies are just placed in cardboard boxes and anybody with a key to the refrigerator has access to the bodies. One of the toxicologists that worked at OME said that Michael told them that he did take a look at the sample of Greg's stomach contents while there. So obviously, it's not good that that happened. That obviously shows a break in the chain of custody. We will come back to this in just a few minutes. Either way, when his body was eventually sent off for his toxicology screen, they found that Greg's stomach contained extremely high concentrations of fentanyl, as well as a small amount of clonazepam and a trace level of oxycodone. According to Dr. Blackborn, the man who performed Greg's toxicology screen, the level of clonazepam that Greg had in his system was considered a therapeutic level and not close to what could have caused an overdose. But he also said that if he had taken it a lot earlier and it metabolized long before the autopsy, it could be possible that he previously had higher levels and that by the time he had the toxicology report that there was just lower levels left. So it was possible that he had more amounts of this drug in his system. However, the discovery of fentanyl in his system was very significant. As I stated before, the OME didn't test for fentanyl because they didn't recognize it as a regularly abused drug at that time. But Pacific Toxicology does regularly test for fentanyl at that time. Based on Dr. Blackburn's assessment, he actually believed that Greg could have died as the result of an acute fentanyl poisoning. In the initial stages of the investigation, police had no real reason to suspect foul play. However, by November 8th, Russ Lowe, the man that Michael replaced as lab manager, called police to report that Michael and Kristen were having an affair. From there, police started to wonder if there really was more going on in this case. Of course, they spoke with coworkers and others close to Kristen and Michael, all who knew about the affair. So, knowing about the affair was a clear motive to police for why Kristen would have wanted to get Greg out of the picture. Then, to add to that, Kristen was literally a toxicologist. She had access to fentanyl at OME. She knew that OME didn't test for fentanyl in their routine screenings. And there was other evidence that we will discuss in just a minute that pointed directly at Kristen being responsible for her husband's death. So, by June 5th, 2001, seven months after Greg's death, she was arrested and charged with the murder of her husband, Greg DeVillis. While awaiting her trial, her parents mortgaged their home in order to post her $1.5 million bail, but because of that, they actually couldn't afford to hire a private attorney, so Kristen was represented by a public defender at trial. The trial started in October of 2002. At the trial, the prosecution argued that Kristen had given Greg clonazepam in order to try and kill him, but it didn't work. So she turned to fentanyl and used that to ultimately kill Greg. They argued that Greg confronted Kristen about the affair and again threatened to tell everybody about that and her drug use if she didn't quit her job. They argued that she killed Greg to keep him quiet and so she could continue her affair with Michael. On the other hand, the defense said that yes, he did die from fentanyl poisoning but it was because Greg was so depressed and so despondent after finding out about the affair that he chose to take his own life. The prosecution started by showing the passionate emails that Michael and Kristen had exchanged. They brought forward the love letters again and the witnesses who testified about the affair that the two were having. Then, there were three different experts who testified at trial. They said that for someone who has not taken opioids before, the concentration found in Greg's bloodstream would be enough to slow the breathing or cause them to stop breathing altogether. They said that the amount of time fentanyl takes to take effect is dependent upon the manner in which it is administrated. 
they said that if it is taken orally, it will take effect in only about 20 to 30 minutes, and if it's injected intravenously, then it only takes five minutes. Then they said if there's a patch placed on the skin, it can take up to an hour or more for it to take effect. But based on the toxicology alone, they could not determine how it was administered in this case. But what they did say was that they believe that based on the differing levels of fentanyl throughout his entire system, and because of how long he had been breathing so slowly and was unconscious, that it probably was administered to him on multiple occasions. So, as we saw Kristen running back and forth between home and work and the grocery store on that day that he was unconscious and breathing very slowly, that could have been when it was administered to him, or that could have just been her checking on him to see if it was working yet. Then the prosecution brought forward some very interesting evidence. Like I mentioned earlier, while working at OME, some of the drugs started to go missing from the office. At first, you would think that it's probably because of her own drug use, but it turned out that 15 fentanyl patches and 10 milligrams of fentanyl were missing from their facility. Again, Kristen was one of the employees responsible for logging the impounded fentanyl into their facility, and she had been working on all three cases that involved the missing fentanyl patches. Additionally, they discovered that there was meth, clonazepam, and oxycodone all missing from their impound as well. Both Kristen and Michael had access to the area where the drugs were stored, and again, as I mentioned earlier, that previous month, both Michael and Kristen attended a conference which discussed fentanyl. It talked about the dangers of fentanyl overdose, and they even got a journal that discussed 25 different cases of deaths caused by fentanyl. Additionally, both Kristen and Michael were well aware that OME didn't test for fentanyl in their routine screening, so it's not a far jump to say that they assumed nobody else did either. They also found files on Michael's computer that showed that he had an expert knowledge of fentanyl and the effects that it has. So it was argued that Michael may have either helped Kristen obtain the drugs or that he looked the other way and knowingly allowed her to take them. They basically said that with Kristen's past, her knowledge of drugs, and the fact that she had easy access to drugs it was a recipe for her to fall back into using, and this clearly showed that she could have been the one who gave Greg the fentanyl. The other thing about this case that made the headlines was the fact that there were rose petals sprinkled all around Greg's body. If you recall a case I covered just a few weeks ago, the case of Christina Parcell, if you remember, there were rose petals sprinkled all around her body as well, so while researching for that case, that is when I found this case. Either way, in the headlines, Kristen was called the American Beauty Killer because of this. The film American Beauty has a scene where one character has a fantasy about the female character having a bath in rose petals, and on the cover, she is lying in a big pile of rose petals. This is Kristen's favorite film, so that is why it's thought that she covered his body in rose petals after killing him. However, at the trial, the defense denies the fact that there were rose petals strewn all about. Now, there are receipts to prove that Kristen did purchase a rose that day, but Kristen said that she actually got a yellow rose and she gave it to Michael that day. The defense argued that the rose petals seen by Greg's body were apparently from the roses that Greg had purchased Kristen for her birthday, so it seemed that he was the one who was holding on to a rose when he took his own life because he was so upset about the affair, and again, these roses sort of represented something that he bought his wife, and then she went and cheated on him. Then, Kristen testified at her own trial about the story that we heard earlier, that when she woke up that morning, Greg seemed very out of it, so she called him out of work. She said that she was back and forth between work, her apartment, and the grocery store, and with Michael that entire day. She said that it was only after she got out of the shower that night that she noticed that Greg was not okay because, again, earlier I said that she said that she had lunch with Greg and that he was fully awake, he was eating, he was walking around, but that he was just on and off going to sleep that day. 
Either way, again, after taking the shower, she saw that Greg was cold to the touch and not breathing, and that is when she called 911. Then, Kristen's parents testified at trial as well. They were adamant that their little girl did not kill her husband. As I stated before, Constance said that Greg was clearly acting out of character and was behaving very bizarrely when she visited them. She said that it was clear to her that Greg was depressed, so that is why he took his own life. Then Ralph, her father, testified about a conversation that Kristen had with her brother months before Greg's death. She confided in her brother that she thinks that she made a mistake by marrying Greg. She worried that she married the wrong person. She wrote in an email, quote, I should have followed my instincts and called off the wedding. Now I'm stuck with the heavy realization that I married the wrong person. Her parents talked about how Kristen is not this drug addict that the media is portraying her as. Ralph said that yes, she had problems that they just were not equipped to handle when she was young but she met Greg, she went back to college, and she conquered her addiction. They do not believe that she started using again while working at OME. So, at the end of the trial, the jury went in for deliberations. They deliberated for eight hours before coming back with their verdict, and by November of 2002, the jury found that Kristen was guilty on the count of first-degree murder with the special circumstance of poisoning, for this, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. We have video of Kristen Ross of walking to court, tightly holding hands with her parents just before her conviction for murder. The victim was her husband, Greg DeVillers. She had claimed he was depressed over the disintegration of their brief marriage and committed suicide. There was a wedding picture propped up near his body. He was found lying on their bed, red rose petals sprinkled about reminiscent of a scene from the Academy Award-winning movie American Beauty. It was an overdose of the painkiller fentanyl that killed him. A quantity was missing from the county medical examiner's office where Kristen worked as a toxicologist. She was convicted and sentenced to life without parole. After her sentencing, she has since filed multiple petitions for appeal. In one of the appeals, Kristen argued that there was a break in the chain of custody for when Greg's body was being transported to the other medical examiner's office. Again, he was in storage for 36 hours, and anybody with a key to the refrigerator could have had access to Greg's body. She said that due to the tensions that her affair caused with the other employees, it's possible that they tampered with his body to add the fentanyl and then frame her because they didn't like her. But after reviewing all of the evidence and going through several courts, her appeals were all denied. Then, by 2006, Greg's family sued Kristen and San Diego County in a wrongful death suit after learning that Kristen was out there selling rights to her story. They were awarded to $100 million in punitive damages, but this was later reduced to 10 million. As for Michael, he was originally charged as a co-conspirator, but these charges have never really been acted on. They've just been sitting there since the early 2000s. It's believed that they filed these charges in case something comes up that gives them enough evidence to prove the charges. They said that if something comes up and they do want to charge him, they have these charges sitting there to prevent an issue of the statute of limitations in the future. And obviously, because of this case, he faced a ton of scrutiny. He quickly returned back to Australia and remarried. I believe he does still work as a very respected toxicologist and still testifies in court hearings about his findings to this day. So, that is all of the information that I have on this case for you all today. Obviously, I do think that Kristen is guilty. I agree with the prosecution that she didn't want her affair and drug use to be exposed by Greg. I think that because OME didn't test for fentanyl, I think she assumed that nobody else would either and that all they would find was those opioids, which would have been much easier to argue as a suicide. But now I want to know what you all think about this case. Do you think that Kristen is guilty? Do you think that Robert helped her get those drugs? If so, do you think he knew what she was planning to do with the drugs? 
Let me know any thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and check out my Facebook as well as my Twitter and Instagram. All will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!